Hello everybody, I'm Rene Ramos, director of the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives, and this is Rewind, the show that looks back on Florida's past with historic film and video. It's time for another trip back into the past, so sit back, relax, and enjoy another episode of Rewind. It may still seem eons away, but the truth is, it'll be here before you know it. Will our air be safe to breathe? The water okay to drink? Will urban development mean the end of our Everglades? What will our houses be like? Tonight, we slip 14 years into the future for a look at our environment on this special edition, Montage 2000. Hello, I'm Ed Odell. No, this isn't my home. Montage hasn't been that good to me. Welcome to the first in a series of special editions looking forward to the year 2000. This one deals with the environment, both outside and in. And that's where we are now, inside a home jam-packed for the future. This house in Boca Raton's Woodfield Hunt Club was built by Stevenson Building and Design. While most of us think of the environment as being outside, the inside is important too, and we're going to look at both tonight. Excuse me, there is someone at the front door. Excuse me, let me go see who that is. Hey, what's happening? What took you so long to come by? Stay there, I'll be right there. Our first segment tonight deals with our future environment. The land and the food it grows is something most of us tend to take for granted, especially when running from our air-conditioned homes to our air-conditioned cars to our air-conditioned office. But Ileana Bravo has been giving some serious thought to our future environment and a hot list of items that could make it onto our future grocery list. Here's Ileana with thoughts on some changes we can expect. Ileana? Thanks, Ed. The year 2000 may seem far off, but the next 14 years will certainly bring dramatic change to our urban environment. By 2000, Florida will be the third largest state in the country. And that runaway growth that transformed Miami from a tourist town to a major city in the last century will rocket us into the next one. is home to 12 million people now and three to five million more are expected to move here by the year 2000. This massive influx makes growth management the new buzzword for the future as we figure out how and where we're going to expand. Since the old days, downtown Miami has become more concentrated at ground level and at cloud level. But despite the pie-in-the-sky dreams of downtown redevelopment mavens, powerful economic trends are now making the real growth happen outside Miami itself. We see that in Dade County with the tremendous development of uh, Dade Land and other shopping centers and the expansion of those centers. And uh, we don't have comparable development downtown. Uh, at all. Ralph Warburton teaches at the University of Miami School of Architecture. He says the trend of the future is away from the cities and towards suburban areas. More than just residential communities, they're becoming business centers in their own right. Things like more sophisticated communications and greater mobility make a decentralized lifestyle possible now and into the future. And that gives Joe Homeowner a whole new option and that is the, the possibility that one could actually move in the middle of almost nowhere and be fully connected. You could have a satellite dish and receive this program. So wherever you live in the future, it will be increasingly possible to have as much contact with the world as you want. As South Florida grows, what's the cost to our natural environment? Well, some planners tell us not to worry since Florida has some of the most far-reaching land use regulations in the country. But in the meantime, people are moving to Florida at a rate of 1,000 a day. From a mosquito-y marshland at the turn of the last century, Dade County has made a lot of progress. As the whole South Florida area has expanded, the push has gone and will keep going further and further west. That's meant draining swamps, building roads, and otherwise accommodating a steady crop of western pioneers. State planners say that each new Florida resident eventually needs $10,000 worth of public services. Given our rate of growth, the tab for roads, sewers, fire protection, and other improvements statewide, now $30 billion, may double by the year 2000. So who will foot the bill? 
probably you in the form of higher taxes. And the developers may have to kick in more money too. But what other costs figure into our push west? For most Floridians, the Everglades is the essence of nature undisturbed, a precious resource worth protecting. With its complex layers of life, we worry about the intrusion of humans into its system. An increase in population and the pressures that they are going to bring into the environment will certainly have have an effect. Dr. Earl Rich is a biologist at the University of Miami. While he admits that the push west affects the glades, he disagrees with people like the governor, who say they'd like to see the Everglades go back to the way it was in 1900. Well, the Everglades is not a totally natural place. The Everglades, as we know it today, is a managed system. That means that man-made levees and water-holding facilities are now keeping the Everglades the way they are. Dr. Rich is confident that human intrusion won't severely disrupt the park's ecosystem. We have decided and drawn the lines as to where we will allow the growth of dense houses and the construction of shopping malls and of uh, apartment complexes, and we've, we've set those lines. Statewide planning is aimed at keeping those limits stable. In the meantime, the Everglades outside of the park may suffer due to a 100% natural intruder, the Malaluka tree. The Everglades east of Chrome Avenue is probably not long for this world. It's not man that's wiping it out, but a tree imported by man in the old days to dry out our worthless swamp. By the year 2000, the East Everglades is likely to be a forest of Malaluka trees. And everywhere in the Everglades, the presence of man is never far away. On the fringe of the Everglades is South Florida's richest agricultural land, where some of these fruits and vegetables are grown. But it takes more than just rain to keep them fresh and clean. You might be surprised to hear about a futuristic way to wipe out pests and hold back spoilage, zapping these fruits and veggies with radiation. The fruit is simply put in this chamber here. Close the chamber. Gamma rays on a mango may sound like something out of science fiction, but it's part of a testing program at the Department of Agriculture's lab in South Miami. This should go down. Our mango is now going down into the center. And a small dose of radiation can replace chemical treatments in ridding produce of pests. And we can then remove the, the product you see no immediate effect. No, the mango's not glowing, nor will you be after eating it, say scientists, because after treatment, no radiation remains in the fruit. Not harmful in any way. But selling the public on the idea may prove to be a challenge. A lot of Americans are afraid of radiation and fear the kind of unnatural effects Woody Allen might have dreamed up. Although the FDA, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Energy have ruled out the possibility of gargantuan fruit or any other harmful side effect, it's just hard to reassure people about radiation. Oh my God, I beat a man insensible with a strawberry. I've always been big on fruit, but this may be taking it a bit too far. We'll be back. I'm Katherine Couric. On a clear day, will you see forever as we enter the 21st century? Find out next on Montage 2000. Miami-Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Jim, the crew didn't leave. They're still here. What do you mean? These white crystals, that's what's left of the human body when you take the water away, which makes up 96% of our bodies. Without water, we're all just three or four pounds of chemicals. Water and air, two of life's little necessities that most of us think will be around forever. But will water be everywhere and safe for us to drink in the future? And the air, will we need a gas mask in order to take a jog? Catherine Couric says the near future doesn't look too threatening, but we might want to start taking precautions now to ensure a safe environment for our future generations. While you watch this report, I think I'll take a dip. The pool temperature is 83 degrees. 
So fine. Here's Catherine Couric. I'll see you later. If you visit American City, you will find it very pretty. Just two things of which you must beware. Don't drink the water and don't breathe the air. We all laugh when satirist Tom Lair sang that song in the 60s, a few of us perhaps a bit nervously. But what will our air and water quality be like in the year 2000? Well, it all depends on who you talk to. In South Florida, we have the dubious honor of living on top of our drinking water supply creates a problem from the standpoint that if you pour it on the ground today, there's a good chance that you could be drinking it tomorrow. And as South Florida becomes more urbanized, our drinking water is likely to get dirtier. Look what happened to the Hialeah and Miami Springs well fields back in July of 83. They were shut down because the water had become so contaminated. But water officials say they'll be back in operation as soon as an air stripping tower like this one is put in place, a method which basically blows the pollution out of the water and puts it right into the air. That's not the only uh, problem in environmentalist in Joe Podgor sees with air stripping. air stripping. He too. says it doesn't get all the pollutants out, and it's extremely costly. In his opinion, this is an example of how paying for past mistakes is replacing planning for the future. What we've been doing instead is gambling with our growth and saying that technology will produce a pill that we can take five to ten years from now in case something does get in the well, and we can try to clean it up, even though today we have no way of knowing how to do that. At the University of Miami, marine scientists are looking to the heavens for help. No, they're not turning to religion, they're turning to the sun, hoping it will eventually do the dirty work when it comes to cleaning up our water. They're experimenting with high-powered lasers to see just how the sun interacts with H2O. This intense amount of energy would then be used in a way, of, way to destroy or modify the chemical species in the water essentially a purification process. Many environmentalists charge we wouldn't need to be experimenting or spending millions on purification if man hadn't stepped on Mother Nature in the name of progress. And there are some scientists trying to ensure we don't take our natural resources for granted in the future. And they're doing it below the surface. I'd like to be under the sea in an octopus's garden in the shade Students of all ages, dubbed aquanauts, are spending 24 hours in an underwater habitat on the floor of a Key Largo lagoon. You feel more a part of it. You feel like you understand it better, like you belong there a little bit more because you've been able to live there for a period of time. And you can get a gander at the fish and other strange marine life from the observation sphere below. You've seen fish in an aquarium before, and you now you feel how the fish feel. You're, you're the thing in the aquarium. The scientists here at Marine Resources Development say this kind of undersea experience also has a place in the resort market. They're planning to lower this undersea hotel in the same lagoon this fall. The marine scientists here have another pet project. They believe the solution to world hunger might be found underwater. The key, they say, is this fairly ordinary looking seaweed that has some extraordinary possibilities. They call them sea sprouts, a food source scientists say is high in protein, vitamin A, and iron. It's a special strain of seaweed that reproduces at an incredible rate. All you need to grow it is salt water and sunlight. We think that the seaweed is going to be the way third world countries spell protein in the next 20 years. It tastes a little like underwater parsley. They're throwing it on salads, pickling it, and they're drying the stuff so it can be mixed with flour for bread, used as a thickener in milkshakes, even as a healthy seasoning. And if we can grow our plants with seawater, uh, we can save our fresh water for human consumption. And I think that in another 20 to 40 years, we're going to come to that. On a clear day. Fortunately for South Florida, it looks like clear days are going to be in the picture for the foreseeable future, thanks to the sea breeze and lack of heavy industry here. <laughs> account for 80 percent of the pollution in the air but the real culprits may be the drivers who aren't following the rules a large number of people in this community are switching over to let it fuel uh, to save perhaps 10 to 11 cents per gallon in addition a lot of people are tampering with the emission control equipment to perhaps make their cars go faster in dade county the number of people switching illegally to let it fuel is twice the national average and the air pollution they're creating is contributing to two other phenomena we may be paying for in the future.
Cars, industry, even burning forests are sending carbon dioxide and other gases into the atmosphere at an ever-increasing rate, resulting in a carbon dioxide ceiling of sorts. The infrared energy from the sun that is usually re-radiated back into space is being trapped and is slowly increasing the Earth's temperature. It's called the greenhouse effect, and scientists say somewhere down the road we may feel like we're living in one. Some predict it will result in temperature increases from 3 to 9 degrees by the year 2050. But that's not all that may happen. Okay. One, of the, one of the potential effects of increasing global temperatures is that we have a lot of ice on the planet today, which, if it melts, will introduce more water back into the ocean. The water's got to go somewhere. And Larry Peterson yeah, says even a small change in sea level will have a dramatic effect on low-lying areas like South Florida. Based on a rise of 15 to 25 feet, some climatologists are predicting that half of the state of Florida will be covered by the sea, though they admit that may be centuries away. The same so-called greenhouse gases may be whittling away the ozone layer as well, the natural shield some 15 miles above the Earth's surface, which protects us from some of the sun's harmful rays. If both these trends continue, it may not only be a lot warmer, in the future you could get four hours worth of sun in just one hour. Will we see these changes as early as the year 2000? Probably not, and more than likely, our water will still be drinkable, our air will be breathable. If the heat gets us down, we could spend a few days of R&R &R sleeping with the snappers. And while we may be munching on sea sprouts at the dinner table, we might want to think twice about building that dream house by the sea. Things don't look too bleak as long as we follow two very appropriate cliches. When it comes to growth, we should proceed with caution. When it comes to our natural resources, we should handle with care. That way, hopefully, we'll never end up like limes to the slaughter. They are drinking the water and breathing <coughs> the air. I'm Jane Wells, and in the year 2000, are we going to dress like this? What will we wear? Where will we live? What will our personal environment be like? Miami-Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Yes, Elroy, it's time to come home. Well, so long, Irving. See you tomorrow. Same time, same sandbox. Well, what took you so long? <laughs> Throughout tonight's program, we've been talking to you about the land, the air, the water. Now it's time to get a little personal. What will the clothes look like in the year 2000? And will we be wearing any? And what will the new homes look like? And how will all of this affect the environment? Jane Wells has the answer to these and other questions about our personal environment in the next century. She'll look at the future by first looking at the past. But before we see that, I'm going to take a bath. Bath and pool. Please select your bath or pool function. Bath temperature. Make that medium. Bath temperature is set at 99 degrees. Fill the bath. Your bath water is running. Okay, while I take a bath, you watch Jane's report. Remember 14 years ago, in 1972, the clothes that were in fashion? It was the dawn of polyester. Platform shoes were nearly as hot as hot pants. Fashion has come a long way, baby. Thank goodness. Well, it will be another 14 years to the turn of the century, and what will clothes look like then? We begin this story on our personal environment with what will encase our bodies in the future. Sketches and fashions have been created by the designers of the future here at the Botter Fashion College in Broward. There are some very definite ideas here about our future clothing and how it will affect our environment. For instance, will we wear more clothing or less? 
I think less clothing probably than more, L less type of clothing, less less constricted, very free. Will the clothes of the future be made of natural fibers or will synthetics win the battle of the material world? I don't think they're going to have the resources for natural fiber and I think that all of these huge mills can just mix up this vat of whatever it is that they pour out and out comes synthetic fibers. I think that's, that's what's happening. Will that mean more polyester? That's not very healthy. But people at Botter say the future will probably mean newer synthetics that allow the body to breathe. Enough of what will be on our bodies. Where will we live? What kind of environment will future homes create? This is called a dome home. Its architect says it's 14 times stronger than a regular home and 70% more energy efficient. He can't understand why the idea hasn't caught on here yet. But again, we got a screwed up environment, okay? We, animals don't live in square boxes. They don't live in shoe boxes, but, but we do. The home uses plenty of natural light and is spacious, giving off a light, comfortable feeling. He says that creates a healthier environment. It's because it's open volume in here, you have less restrictions. So therefore, you can relax more. The only downside? Sound. In this structure, it just goes crazy. Sometimes we holler to kids and they can't hear us. Other times they whisper and they hear everything you're doing. He's built several of these homes for the government of China and he hopes to build more in the states. He says the curved shape of the home is especially suited to South Florida because it can stand up better to a hurricane than a rectangular home. And one thing you can bet will be in nearly every home by the turn of the century, a computer control system. Wake up, chiefs. Good afternoon, Rule. This is the computer you've seen Ed O'Dell fooling with tonight, the Butler One system created by Rua Lani and Don Packham. By voice command, the computer can do almost anything in the house for you. Start the fireplace. The fire is on. I guess it started about uh, 10 years ago when uh, I first saw a movie called 2001. Good evening, Dave. How you doing, Hal? Everything's running smoothly. and you Since I saw that movie, it has always been my goal to create a voice-controlled environment where you could have basically anything you needed done for you done by a voice command. Fill the bath. Your bath water is running. This computer, complete with a British accent, will only give out information and take commands. It will not disobey, unlike Hal. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Of course, every uh, once in a while, the butler the computer like just before. won't hear you. Wake up, Jeeves. Wake up, Jeeves. This computer can also work as a security system. Instead of just sounding a burglar alarm, it gives you information. Warning, warning, intrusion in the great room. These scientists believe computer systems, which control your home, will create a more secure environment. Right now, the system costs a pretty pity, about $50,000. But there are cheaper systems available, and the prices will go down as we get closer to the year 2000. So maybe the ideal home environment of the future will be one that combines machines with nature. Of course, if this is the home environment you dream of having someday, complete with dolphins in your den, you may have to wait till the year 2010, unless you have a lot of money and imagination. They've already eaten dinner. You haven't. Of course, in 14 years, some of us will still be paying the mortgages on homes we own now. Big change. We'll be back. Miami-Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Has he asked for anything special? Yes, this morning for breakfast. Uh, he requested something called wheat germ, organic honey, and tiger's milk. <laughs> oh, yes, those are the charm substances that some years ago were felt to contain life-preserving properties. You mean there was no deep fat? That's all the time we have for scenes from this week's montage. Be sure and join us next time when Michael Putney answers critics' comments as to why he used two controversial words on our show. And as for me, some weeks this job has its paydays, and other days it just pays. Oh, yeah. Here's to the future. Good night. <sighs> Thank you.
That's about it for this edition of Rewind. Just time to remind you that Rewind features historical film and video from the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives. To see more from the Wolfson Archives collections, visit our website, wolfsonarchives.org. You can search the archives catalog and watch video online. And be sure to connect to our YouTube channel where you will find hundreds of carefully curated clips or link to the Wolfson Archives Facebook page to keep up with our busy calendar of historical happenings. Until next time, I'm Rene Ramos. Thanks for watching. Oh, wow.